So this is a great session. We have collected some questions from the audience uh, throughout the meeting so far, and we're gonna address those from the podium. In addition, this can be a very lively interactive session. So the um, catch boxes, the blue box in the middle of the room here, there should be one more around there. Um, go ahead and use those to ask questions as we go through this session. So uh, wel welcoming back up to the stage, Wendy Cantrell and Andrea Wynn, and let's jump right into the Q&A session. They're gonna be sending us these, I think, to our oh. So one of the most frequent topics that's coming through, that's coming through in terms of questions is related to the newer agents, abracitinib and upadacitinib for atopic dermatitis. And the question is monitoring and what, what should you monitor? How often should you monitor it? And then continually over the years, how often should you maintain that monitoring? So, um, we actually have a slide that shows the suggested monitoring that we're gonna be putting up in um, a session later this morning. But let's talk about these agents as they've come to market. I know we all have experience with them. Um, what's your sort of routine so far have you developed in terms of baseline screening and then follow up? Uh, baseline screening, I, I do like to order um, a, a full screening panel, so I like to look at a CBC, a CMP. Uh, I will check them for, you know, if I have a clinical concern for hepatitis, quantifier and gold. Uh, another thing, though, that I, I think is not necessarily touched on a whole lot, I have a lot of very young patients with ATOP that tend to go to the gym a lot. And when they go to the gym and they bulk and they take supplements, those sometimes can cause you know, some, some changes in lab abnormalities. So even with CK values, that's something that I like to check. Uh, if, if I know the patient is taking you know, any supplements that may affect that, uh, and, and that has sometimes you know, come back as something that we need to discuss with those medications. You know, and I think the the companies have done really well in getting us information on when we should, how often we should check labs. Um, so I, I tend to go by go by their recommendations um, initially, um, and you know I, I think just like psoriasis patients, our atopic patients are patients that do have some comorbidities. So I do think it's our responsibility to look at the patient individually and to to check the labs as we need to care for them, not only for their skin, but for also their comorbidities, because some of these patients do not see primary care, mm -hmm. and we can, we can help facilitate their overall health, and not just their medication. And, and that's a great point, Wendy, is because a lot of them, because they don't see their PCP, they may have uh, undiagnosed conditions or un, you know, undiagnosed comorbidities. Uh, some of the, the recommendations are you know, for you to check a lipid panel after you start therapy, but if a patient hasn't been getting their lipid panel r routinely checked, they, they may have some underlying you know, elevations that are not diagnosed yet. So, so you may want to consider getting a baseline too, just so you can clinically correlate uh, whether any elevations are related to treatment or not. Right. Yeah, I think it's important for each of us <clears throat> to standardize how we do it, and there's no reason to get an idea of your patient's overall health prior to initiating therapy with a small molecule. We want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to, and so I think, you know, it's interesting how we all sort of choose what we're going to do, and um, I think talking to the patients about the pre-screening is similar to talking to a potential psoriasis patient before you initiate biologics. You gotta screen for stuff. And uh, I screen for a lot of things. Um, I do all the things that you all suggested, and then I screen for all the viruses. I can't look at somebody and determine whether they have HIV based on looking to them or talking Correct, to them. Yeah. So I actually screen that for everyone, as well as the hepatitis panels. And I just simply explain to the patient, I say, hey, we're just trying to get a picture of your overall health. We're gonna check you for infection, make sure you don't have any active infection or history of infection. So we're gonna screen for all the viruses. And then I just say it just like that, and I don't get a lot of questions about why this, why that. I just say, we're gonna screen for all the viruses. And then if they ask specifically what it is, I'd say, well, we're gonna look for exposure to bacteria, bacterial infections as well, such as, quanti such as TB. But then we'll look at hepatitis and HIV screening. And usually they're cool with that. 
But for the jacks, I'm definitely going to do a baseline on all of them. Mm -hmm. And then after a month, I'll do a second check. Right. And then I'll probably do every three months. For how long? Ask me next year. <laughs> So, Wendy, you know, one question that comes up year after year, the biologic boot camps and um, psoriasis talks is how long, how often do you repeat the virus scan? So, yes, so I, on an annual basis, me, what I do is for TNF patients, I do a, a yearly quantiferum gold, mm -hmm. basically for insurance purposes, but also just overall health. And then I check um, liver functions on them as well as a CBC. For the 17s and the 23s, I do a quantiferum gold exclusively, unless there's some history of something that I'm following up on. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I also practice in an area where, um, we, you know, sometimes unfortunately we, we do see some TB, so I, I do always double check, you know, and, and continue to monitor them with quantiferum golds, uh, just because you can't have patients that convert. What do they do in Alabama? We do that as well. <laughs> but I, would, I just want to point out, and you know, Kara is so good about pointing out, you know, that she's endemic for histo. So know, know what infections are endemic in your area because you should be checking for those as well if that applies to the area you practice. So, so one, one last point about the, or maybe not the last point, maybe we'll talk more about other things, but with respect to the small molecules for atopic dermatitis, uh, the other question is, uh, we saw data for Rinvoke today, and we saw some potential signals for viral infections. Mm -hmm. So for these patients that were initiating therapy, uh, are you going to recommend them getting a shingles vaccine? For sure, if they're over 50. Um, although, you know, I part years ago participated in the TOFA trial, and, and we had good many portions of, pa of our patients that were in the trial that um, were not 50 yet and did come down with, with zoster. So um, I think that's a conversation that you need to have. I don't think that it's as strong as a signal. Well, it's not as strong of a signal as it is with TOFA or gel jans, um, but I, I do think it's a conversation that you should have with the patient. And I mean, the problem is, is getting insurance to write it, I mean, to accept it and cover it. Um, but I've had good luck with insurance if I send information, you know, that they're going to be on immunosuppressant. Um, they tend to cover it. I've had some that won't until they're 50. But, you know, it, it's a pretty easy thing to do is just say, I'm putting this patient on immunosuppressant medication. I, I agree, uh, definitely if they're over 50 and they're, they're under and then we have that discussion. And again, you know, it, it, it does come down to a little bit of a discussion about coverage and, and how they can access that. Yeah, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the same, but I am gonna recommend it for um, younger patients as well. And then- so, so here's a question for you. So with the new Shingrix shot that requires two, when will you start? A jack. Will you start it after the first one, or are you going to require them to have both? I'm going to start therapy. I'm not. I'm, these patients right. are suffering, and we're not going to withhold. Right. Um, but I'm going to tell them, and I have been telling them, they need to get scheduled. Yeah. To have it done. Yeah. I usually tell them to have it at least have the first one done um, while we're getting insurance approval. I mean, of course, we have samples and that kind of thing. So, but during that phase, while we're doing insurance investigation, I would like for them to get that but whatever vaccine they need I'm I'm looking at the questions coming in I am not playing goofing around on my phone so don't judge me jo Joe's taking <laughs> selfies up here you can judge me. <laughs> um, so yeah a lot, a lot of questions about the jacks and the monitoring and how we're gonna do it and um, these are new agents we're all gonna learn through experience and I think the key is to have a really very clear understanding of what the potential risks are and as long as patients know ahead of time what they may expect, then that's going to be the key. And so getting uh, adept at the conversation and with the patient so that you can fully advise them and answer all their questions and they know uh, what they might expect and if it does happen that they know exactly what to do is going to be essential for us. 
And, and maybe a, a question we can, you know, kind of discuss and, and come to mind is uh, what, how do we shift the conversation and the discussion when we talk about the topicals, right? Because they, they do have, uh, you know, the same kind of labeling and in our patients, are we having any sort of considerations for that? I love that question, mm -hmm. question because you don't want a patient to go home with ruxolitinib and open up the package insert and read it and, and, and you not have warned them about what they're going to see. So I let them know very clearly that this is a topical medication. You're going to get 60 grams of that per month and no more with atopic dermatitis. With vitiligo, I think you saw 60 grams a week can be given. Um, but I tell them with 60 grams, a month, it's essentially impossible to get a systemic response, uh, even if, maybe if you ate it or you, you took the whole tube and occluded over a huge body surface area, but if they use a little bit, a couple times a day, on and off, or even consistently for a month, they're not going to get a systemic, systemic absorption. What we're seeing in the label is related to an oral medication. Right. And I, I tend to tell my patients, um, that for both the topical and the new the new jacks is that it's kind of they inherited the sins of the father kind of thing you know and that the the package insert the black label it all was started with with tofacitinib and um, that not all of them there are signals but not all of them have occurred in large numbers um, in the topicals or the two new jacks that's great. So we, there's a question on the app that says, um, have you had experience with VTAMA um, to pin her off 1% cream and have you had any cutaneous tolerability issues? Um, so, you know, our, our site participated in their clinical trials and I have used quite a bit of it in private practice since launch. Um, my patients have been doing very well. Tolerability is, uh, you know, not something I struggle with uh, in my practice or in my experience. Um, you know, with with this product, what's interesting is that they, you do have in a small number of patients a little bit of like follicular plugging uh, that can kind of look kind of like KP. Um, so, you know, traditionally that uh, has resolved in, in most cases I've seen. I haven't had any issues with toler tolerability at all. Um, I think that. The, the vehicle for this product, if you haven't tested it, is very nice. Um, I've even had it, I've had a patient on a biologic that um, had that one at the base of the neck, you know, that one trouble spot that, that can, can just um, be, be problematic for patients. And they were able to, to kind of rub it into their hair. It was a female, rub it into their hair and, and, and get some good relief from it. Um, the itch data is fantastic. Um, you know, it, it does kind of take care of that itch. Um, I haven't seen the folliculitis yet. Um, you know, the data shows that um, it was most were mild or moderate and they didn't stop therapy um, in the clinical trials. So I think that's important to know. Um, you know, you could throw in some, some topical clindamycin lotion if you, had, if you had a patient that was more severe or bothered by the folliculitis. Um, you know, that is, that is an option that you could do as well. Yeah, and I, I will say I, I really love it in my patient population because I have a lot of people of skin of color, so darker Fitzpatrick skin types, and you don't see quite um, the same, you know, pigmentation changes that you do uh, with topical corticosteroids, and it's very nice since it's just once a day application. So it's low maintenance for patients. It's not greasy. It's not getting stuck on their clothes. So I, you know, my patients have been very pleased using the product. I also have not had any tolerability issues. So um, how about um, the next question is related to Abri, um, which is Trilokinumab. Um, the question is, does anybody have experience with Abri? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. So um, I had, uh, we participated um, when I was in academics in, in the clinical trial, so I got to play with it um, before launch. Um, I've had really good results with patients um, after, after launch. Um, I think it's, you know, getting through the, the patient support system and, and um, the copay assistance and, and the insurance approval. Um, but I think it's very well tolerated. Um, you know, it's a little bit, you know, you do have a lot of injections that first, that first day. Um, you know, so that, 
if you have somebody that doesn't love shots and you're trying to teach them how to give the injection, they're doing four. Um, so we've had a couple of patients pass out <laughs> uh, with the four um, injections. But um, again, for most patients, again, they're desperate. They're, des they're, they're desperate for um, help for their AD. So, um, but I do think it's a good product. Yeah, I, I haven't had anyone pass out on me yet, thank, uh -huh. thank goodness. Well, True, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I agree, you know, the, the starting dose, I do like to do those a lot of the times in clinic myself, and you know, we'll go over injection training and I'll do a couple and then I'll let the patient try to do the others. Uh, and, and it's just for that initial dose, just because of the loading. Right. And um, can you speak to the mechanism of action, how it's different than dupilumab? So, so it's an IL-13, it's more of an IL-13 instead of an IL-4, um, and that's the basic difference. So it, it dupilumab binds on to the IL-4 docking site and blocks IL-4 from binding, and dupilumab is a big old molecule, and as a consequence, IL-13 can't bind onto its receptor either extracellularly. Mm -hmm. And the mechanism for um, Tralokinumab is a little different in that it sort of mops up free-floating IL-13. Yeah. Is that right, Andrew? Did I get it right? Yes, you did. <laughs> so it's a nuance that w I think we all want to you know, really grasp onto as we get more molecules coming. There's another one coming, um, which is Lebrachizumab, which will be in a simil more similar in mechanism of action to tralokinumab. So th there is a difference between the biologics and how they exert their effect and the consequence of that downstream and the regulation of the cytokines and the inflammatory regulation is going to be potentially different. So appreciating the mechanism is going to be really important for us. Absolutely. We're going to see, I think, a lot of uh, the nuance of the immunology in the AD space like we have uh, with the psoriasis. Uh, and it'll be very interesting, too, with some of the development coming in uh, uh, different subtypes like parigonodularis mm -hmm. and, and other upcoming things. Great. Expanded indications. Mm -hmm. Okay. So another question from the app. Um, what, are your, what are special tests, diagnostic tests that you may do in your office that provides the most useful information that you actually do, not stuff that they teach you in school that you'll never do, but what are little clinical things that you do in the office, hair pull test, other little things that you may do that um, newer grads may benefit from, any little, tri little tricks or pearls? I think a KOH is something that every derm provider should be very comfortable with. That can offer a lot of um, narrowing down your differentials and knowing what you're treating. Um, because if you're treating something that's KOH positive, you don't, you, positive, you don't want to put um, a steroid on it. You want to make sure you're treating it accurately. So I do think that that is something that I do in the office um, and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with. You know, it, it does add time. You have to wait for that. You have to wait for the prep to um, dissolve so that you can see um, whether it's positive or not. I do think that that's very important. Yeah. Um, I, you know, that's good, and I, I would say be comfortable with, you know, learning how to order and, and perform biopsies, like doing a DIF, mm -hmm. uh, and knowing that, you know, there, there's some time sensitivity to that when you take that specimen, and the solution that you have to put it in is Michelle's solution. Mm -hmm. um, tissue cultures are always helpful, too, yep. especially when you're looking for atypical, you know, infections. You know, they specifically ask about the hair pull test. I do think that that's an important test to gently you know, kind of, if you have somebody coming in, and all of us have seen tons of COVID-related telogen effluvium, um, I think that that is very helpful um, to, to patients, you know, to, to look and see if they're still having active shedding um, and explaining to them what, what telogen effluvium is and that kind of thing. I also, um, you know, do, um, sometimes I will do part width, you know, so I will measure part width um, to see if we if we document whether they are continuing to lose hair or whether they're not, um, but you know I'll document it you know he, you know here and on the sides and in the back. Okay, no, I, I agree. I do all I do most of those things. Um, let me ask a follow up question since you brought it up, uh, Wendy, and um, this is a subject in question we get all the time, which is what about 
um, which, which specific labs do you run in a patient that you're seeing for hair loss? You know, there's a lot Let's of- Let's say a female, adult female patient. Right, there's a, there is a lot of um, variability in when, you, when you're looking at the literature on this. I think the basic, um, I, I do a CBC, I wanna make sure they're not anemic. That's a, a, that can be a cause of hair loss. You wanna run um, your thyroid screen to make sure that their thyroid is okay. Um, depending on their age, you know, you may, you may run um, an FSH um, to, to see if they're, you know, menopausal or perimenopausal. Um, so those are those are the kind of the basics, and I think you can you can get really deep in the weeds, um, you know. But that is a good starting place um, to, to to check. What about you guys? Yeah, uh, similar. I'll I'll make sure that they're not anemic. I like to double check for thyroid, um, and, and sometimes some of the hormones too. Uh, if I have a strong suspicion for any sort of hormone abnormality, though, sometimes I'll work with their primary care, even if there's right. a strong suspicion for for disease. Uh, endocrine is always nice mm -hmm. uh, as a as a referral there. Um, but you know, I think a lot of the times, though, sometimes you can have patients who just have hair loss that. They are very, very distraught about, and it's not necessarily uh, TE or um, you know from any sort of uh, m severe medical disease. And it's our job to make sure that we exclude that, uh, and then also to kind of uh, set the stage for you know what expectations of therapy are, what therapy choices there are for you know just um, sometimes some hair loss as time goes on. Yeah. So let. So let's say that. The workup is negative. Vitamin D is normal, ferritin storage is high, no PCOS, DHEAS levels are within normal limits. What's your recommendation to that patient? No effluvium present. Um, I, you know, sometimes I'll use like off-label spirone or lactone. I really like, um, you know, there's a, a compounded topical finasteride minoxidil mm -hmm. I'll use sometimes too, although not everybody loves putting something in their, in their hair. You know, and for, you know, there is some, there is some literature on um, Propecia in females if they are, if they are menopausal or have had a hysterectomy. Yeah. I, you know, that has worked. Um, there are several vitamin supplements that are aimed towards um, healthy skin, hair, and nails um, that, that I found very helpful in some patients. But a lot of this is hand-holding it. You know, it, this is, these are the patients that our medical assistants come to us with their eyes like this going, this is going to be terrible. Um, you know, and they're always very distraught. They're distraught, and you know, and I find I find that sitting down on my stool, getting close knee to knee with them, talking with them, being compassionate and empathetic, and you know that kind of thing, it, it goes a long way. Um, there's no magic wand um, for hair loss. We all know that, and then we see it on our schedule, and you're like, oh, this is either going to go good or it's going to go really <laughs> bad. Um, you know, so it, it is one of those things that we can't fix all the time, and you know, we like to fix things. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, too. I, there's a couple of vitamins I like. I like Nutrafol. I also use Viviscal. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do caution my patients not to start overdosing because I find that sometimes when they're so upset about their hair loss, they will buy several hair vitamins right. and take all of them. Yeah. You know, not as you know indicated, and so so that's something that we just have to set realistic expectations with our patients, and it, and it does come to kind of the labor of love and and the counseling and a little bit of hand holding. Right. Yeah, I, I, Nutrafol is uh, spending a lot of money marketing direct to consumer as well right. as selling, uh, dispensing out of the offices. Um, every single female in our office is taking that stuff and feels like it works. <laughs> um, so um, th I think that's interesting as a recommendation, um, but I think, yeah, that's very helpful. So, okay, couple more questions. First one, um, what level of cirrhosis, at which level of cirrhosis would you consider not prescribing a JAK inhibitor to a patient? With concomitant cirrhosis? Oh, I would, I would tread very 
carefully and, and make sure that GI gives you, you know, approval because also the consideration is you can have a lot of drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Mm -hmm. um, and these medications, because they're, they're metabolized by, you know, these specific enzymes and traditionally patients are going to be, uh, you know, have cirrhosis, they potentially will be on several medications and, and have other medical conditions as well. So, um, you know, it's something to, to make sure you, you co-manage with your, your GI. And we're used to intercollaboration, yeah. interdisciplinary collaboration, and I think it's important um, when we have a new disease state that has, um, you know, some comorbidities and some lab abnormalities to, to make sure that you have um, the confidence in to, to contact that GI or that primary care doctor and make sure that, you know, you're caring for the patient um, collectively. Yeah, I would just add on, I would consider not prescribing a JAK inhibitor to that patient first line. Right. Um, unless they've tried and failed. We have several um, monoclonal antibodies that are not processed through the liver. Right. So um, I, would, I would go to do pilumab and I would go to tralokinumab initially. We also have topicals uh, that you would consider that we didn't have before that you may not think about, like topinarov. So, um, and more to come. So. Right. I think that's how we'd handle that. So we have one additional question. Do you agree to continue prescribing Dapsone to a patient with dermatitis or herpetiformis who refuses to adopt a gluten-free diet? <laughs> I mean, we've all had non-compliant patients. Um, you know, unfortunately, if they don't adopt that gluten-free diet or, you know, I have several um, DH patients that just need, they have pretty good control if they reduce their gluten intake. Um, they're the ones that are itching. They're the ones that are miserable. And, you know, I, will I prescribe Dapsone? Probably. I think I would. Um, at, but at, the, at that point, it's, you know, they have to, they have to take control of their own condition and their own um, compliance. Um, you know, we can't make them take the medicine or we can't make them watch their gluten. Yeah, I would be more concerned about G ruling out G6PD deficiency oh, sure. yeah. and monitoring that. And like you said, you can bring the horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. And, you know, we, our job is to control the skin as best we can and relieve them of their symptomatology. We'll be treating the underlying condition as best we could, but they have to understand that they are and may be doing something that's making their condition worse. I mean, uh, some, I think Dr. Armstrong talked about the keto, ketogenic diet, right. where you eliminate this and you eliminate that and you eliminate everything that you enjoy in life. <laughs> so I think, you know, taking someone to a full gluten-free diet may be difficult. Right. Yes. All right, let me see if we have one other here. Okay, this is interesting. Um, is there a, res a resource where reliable anti-inflammatory recipes can be found? You know, I mean, as much as we don't like Dr. Google, sometimes Google can offer, <laughs> you know, a, a great resource. I don't know of one specifically for an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, do you? I don't know of any one that has been good as far as a collection of recipes. Um, you know, I, I do think that Dr. Google in this case is probably the only and time I would recommend. Pinterest, <laughs> Pinterest would probably be a, a reasonable resource yeah. too, um, if you're a Pinterest what? user. And, and one thing I, 
I would say to, to caution too, because we're we're in an age where many things are being labeled as like organic and you know kind of healthy options. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, these alternative products though they can have a lot of chemical additives and still have uh, inflammatory effects, even though they're packaged as being like sort of a a, a more healthy option. Uh, and so we really have to encourage our patients to be more deciphering of reading the fine print and looking at what they're eating. I, I tend to advise my patients to try to stay away from processed foods mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of those additives, they, they get processed uh, as inflammatory, pro-inflammatory chemicals. Yeah, and you know, Dr. Armstrong showed the data and the literature yesterday that showed that uh, specific to dermatology, uh, for psoriasis patients, if you can reduce the BMI, that can be helpful, and maybe a Mediterranean diet uh, would be the way to go. So with that, I'd love to thank our panelists, Wendy and Andrea, for joining us, and we are gonna move back into CME.